Welcome to Gospel Tangents, the best source for Mormon history, science, and theology. I'm Rick Bennett. In our next conversation with Jonathan Neville and Jim Lucas, authors of By Means of the Urim and Thummim, we're going to talk about Oliver Cowdery as a witness to the Restoration. We'll talk about his efforts to translate the Book of Mormon, and Jonathan and Jim have a different idea on DNC 8 and 9, which talks about where Oliver tried to translate the Book of Mormon. So you won't want to miss this conversation. Check it out. Let me, let, let me just make a comment on that. Right. We're not trying to convince anybody of anything. <laughs> so what, we look at this and we say, okay, there's Joseph Smith and Oliver Cowdery were explicit. They said he used the Urim that came with the plates. Other people had other versions of it. Well, so since so, you mentioned Oliver, yeah, because DNC nine, uh, studied out in your mind. Everybody's familiar with that. Right. But supposedly the original versions of DNC nine were like, well, Joseph, or Joseph said to Oliver, well, you can use your rod because apparently you had a thousand DNC rod. eight. That, that's DNC not, eight. Actually, sorry. that's not what it says. That that was referring to something else, not the translation. It was. Yeah, yeah. Using the rod. The, the Lord had told them, I've, I've taught you other things. In effect, we could pull it up and see. But you're talking about the gift of Aaron now. It says, now it says the gift of Aaron. Before it said, the, use the rod. And it wasn't that the wasn't translate the translation. The he wasn't using the gift of Aaron for the translation. What was it, what was it for? He, was, he used that for other spiritual guidance and information that he was getting. It, it wasn't the, the translation per se. It didn't say you could use the gift of Aaron for the translation. Because I was just... We, I was just talking about up. that, and yeah. I said, "How how is Joe, how is Oliver going to use a dowsing rod? Is, are the words going to appear on the right. rod, or how, how does that work?" No, that's yeah, that's DNC eight. Really, that was a different. Uh, conversation. You don't think he was trying to translate the Book of Mormon? He yeah, tried he to, but that's with was, the rod. No, with the Yerman Thummim. With the Yerman Thummim. You think he was trying to translate? But well, Zenas Gurley addressed this too. He said, "No yeah. one other than Oliver Cowdery ever saw the Yerman Thummim until the three witnesses." So, until the three witnesses? Until the three witnesses saw the Urim and Thummim. In an angelic manifestation that was made them the three witnesses. Well, wouldn't, I mean, if there was no curtain between Oliver and Joseph, wouldn't he have seen yeah, the Yeah, as Urim I said, Thummim? no one other than Oliver saw it. Oh, other, other than, than Oliver. I misheard Oliver. you. Right, okay. yeah. But uh, go ahead and talk. Okay. I, I want to pull this up because I want okay. to show you it's a different thing he's talking okay. about. Okay, so, um, so that's one thing from Emma where is, you know, she can't. She's clear that she needs to go back and look at her times and seasons. It's fifty years later, and she really and she did see Joseph use the seer stone to do his demonstration. And David Whitmer said that she was there when that happened. So that would explain it. And you know, for a short explanation to rebut the Spalding theory, it's pretty pretty direct and to the point, saying, "Oh no, no." There was no manuscript because he had his face in his hat, so he couldn't be looking at a manuscript. So that's you know it's a good rebuttal for the Spalding theory, which is was the main thing that everybody was concerned about in the 1870s because it was universal by then. So then you get to so you know so there's questions. So we're not saying that that letter is a phony letter. We're not saying that she didn't write that letter, but we're saying you got to look at it in its full context. You know, people lift that one little sentence out of that letter, and then you're taking well, it out people, of a much bigger these, context. These aren't just your average historians. These are like Richard Bushman. <laughs> yeah. A lot of people are going to trust what Richard Bushman says. Okay. But here's, here's my response to all the historians. None of them are witnesses. All they're doing is interpreting the same information that's available to everyone. And so we look at it. I know I've been criticized because I'm looking at all this from a lawyer's perspective. Right. But I look at it, of course, it's inherent at, at this point, but I look at it as just analytical. I mean, how do you, when, when someone says something happened, how do they know that that happened? And when they don't tell you how they know it happened, you can assume and infer that it was a rumor, it was secondhand, it was hearsay, et cetera. So let me get back to this DNC 8, though. Okay. Because you, you conflate it a little bit, and I wanted to make sure that everybody understands. Well, I think it's not just me conflating those together, because I've heard that from if, Claire if they, Barris and a lot of if other people. If they are, then yeah. they're, they're all making an error, because it says right here, the Lord this starts off talking about the spirit of revelation, right? Mm -hmm. this, this is, is DNC 8. DNC 8. Behold, this is the spirit by which Moses brought the children of Israel over the Red Sea and so on. And this is thy gift, and you should apply it. 
And then in, in verse six, it says, um, now this is not all thy gift, for you have another gift, which is the gift of Aaron. And it, originally it said the gift of the rod, or using the rod. Behold, it has told you many things. Behold, there is no other power save the power of God that can cause this gift of Aaron to be with you. Therefore, doubt not. But see, it says it's another gift, a separate gift. And that it had told them things in the past. It had nothing to do with the translation of the Book of Mormon. And that is pretty explicit when you, when you read the whole thing in context. That's verse uh, 6. This is not all thy gift, the gift of revelation. For you have another gift, which is the gift of working with the rod originally. Actually, they, they changed it twice. It was, I don't remember the interim one, uh -oh. but it was the gift of working with the rod, then it was something else, and then Sidney Rigdon said, well, we ought to just call it the gift of Aaron, and that's how it ended up. Hmm. But it says, behold, it has told you many things, right? And so, and working with the rod is a common practice even today. I, I mean, I've, I have experience with that in my work when I was working for a landscaping company. That's how mm -hmm. we find water. So it can tell you things in a lot of different ways. But it's not the translation that it's talking about. And it makes that pretty clear here, it, it, the distinction. See, wait a minute, because I, I just pulled it up on mine. Yeah. DNC 8, the preface says, Revelation given through Joseph Smith, the prophet, to Oliver Cadre at Harmony, Pennsylvania, April 1829, in the course of translation of the Book of Mormon. Yeah. Says it right there. Oliver, who continued to serve as a scribe, writing at the prophet's dictation, desired to be endowed with the gift of translation. Exactly. The Lord responded by supplication to grant this. Yeah. So I'm having a hard time believing you when you say this had nothing to do with well, the it's translation. Right here. It's, I'll read it again. Because the Lord, the first few verses talk about the spirit of revelation. But isn't this the context we're talking about? Isn't, isn't yeah. that preface the context? It, yeah, it is. Okay. But he, that's why it's, it's important. It says, after the Lord explains the gift of revelation and that he would use for translation, mm -hmm. he says, now this is not all thy gift, for you have another gift, which is a gift of Aaron, which has told you many things. It's a separate, it's a separate gift. It, it clarifies that the gift of translation is not your only gift. You also have this gift of the gift of Aaron, it says here, that has told you many things in the past. Right, so it's not talking about he's going to use that gift to do the translation. It makes it. I don't know how to. Make, it could be any more clear because it says this gift of using inspiration in connection with the translation is not all thy gift. You have another gift that you've used in the past, and then it says the reason the Lord brought that up is he says there's no other power other than the power of God that can cause this gift of Aaron to work with you. So in other words, I used my power to help you with this gift of Aaron that you've used in the past. Or the gift of the rod. The gift of the rod. Yeah, right. Or working with the rod. And then he says, so doubt not about uh, the gift of God that you can be able to use in the future with the translation. But it's, he, he made it clear that it was, you had another gift. This inspiration to translate is one gift I'm giving you now. But you have another gift that you used in the past, and that was also my power. I mean, that's... Well, then we get to DNC 9, and he's like, will you... You misunderstood. That's right. He <laughs> you misunderstood. Need to study that in your mind. <laughs> That's right, because he thought all he had to do was ask. Right. Right. But Joseph had already told us that when he first got the plates, he had to copy the characters and translate them. He was that was an effort. He didn't just ask. Well, that was one of the interesting things because we hear concerning the book of Abraham that there's the Egyptian alphabet and letters and whatever, right. and then there's a big controversy about that. Right. Um, I was surprised when I read Garrett Dirkmont's book that he did the same thing with the Book of Mormon, that they were trying to figure out a, kind of a, an alphabet and that sort of a thing. Well, I mean, that's right in Joe Smith history. That's the first thing he did with it when he got the plates. I hadn't heard about the alphabet, or maybe I just didn't remember. Well, it's just, well it wasn't alphabet, it was characters. He was copying out the characters. Yes. Well, it sounded very similar to what he did with the Book of Abraham. At least yeah, although he didn't have the Urim and Thummim with the Book of Abraham. I mean, we ought to talk right. about the Book of Abraham sometime. But to me, it was a, entirely a different process. Okay. But this one, he said, he with the Urim and Thummim, he translated the characters after he copied them. I know that the narrative that I've heard from church historians is when he first started, he thought he could do it himself. And then after he lost 116 pages, he realized he couldn't do it himself, so he had to rely on the stone and the hat, which to me is is a... Non sequitur. Well, I know but. that Richard Bushman's case is he just found it easier 
to use the stone in the yeah. hat rather than the urim and thummim. Right. It just made it easier. And looking at those, you know, they're so big. <laughs> well, we don't know how big they I'll are. Ha- I'll have to put a picture where I have them up because one of my listeners sent me yeah. a... Uh, I think he three D printed the lenses or something. <laughs> but people but cool. speculate on how big and they are too. So, but but it's very right. similar to what you have on your hat there. Yeah. Um, and so I was just like, these are so huge. Like it would be hard. Well, to you use. could you could speculate that they were really big or any size. They were just larger than normal spectacles. Right. I have a pair of spectacles from the eighteen twenties, and they're much smaller than Jim's. They're really small. Oh yeah. To, mm-hmm. For someone in the eighteen twenties, Jim's spectacles nose. would look large. Yeah. Right. So I, I think it was William that said that they were larger than a normal man today would wear. But when you look at what they were wearing in the 1820s, they were small. So, you know, and think about it this way, too. Moroni said these are prepared for you to translate the Book of Mormon. Would Moroni give him something that he couldn't use? That, that doesn't make sense. Well, <laughs> you know, Oliver's rod it didn't work. <laughs> well, Oliver wasn't using the rod for that, though. That was a separate gift he'd used okay. before. Like I said, I, I can use a rod and it works great. Really? Yeah. To find water. You've found water? Oh, all the time. Yeah. Well, I used to do it as a job. Oh, I didn't know that. In, in landscaping, because we'd go to a project, there's underground sprinklers, you don't know where they are. So you have to use rods to find all the underground sprinklers. Wow. I've had other experiences with it. We could talk about that some other time. Oh, yeah. but, but there's I professional want to get video of that. There's professional rodsmen. Oh, I know Wayne May supposedly uses them all. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, okay. Um, I'll, I'll um, give you an anecdote just to give a, an advance on a future topic maybe, but I've taken a, I Is learned a preview? to use, I, I learned to use a rod at BYU because I was, I majored in agricultural economics. Yeah. One of our professors was a professional rodsman that would find water. Really? The, yeah. And so I've taken some of these BYU scholars out <laughs> with the rods to show them how they work. And they worked for about half of them. They worked and they couldn't believe it, but they can find things in the ground with rods. And you may be a Rosma too. I don't know. I, I tried it with my kids. I've never tried. Well, sometime we should do it because right, it is amazing how me. effective it is. You'll, you'll have to make me a believer. Okay. <laughs> well, just to give you another citation, uh, uh, Steve Pinnaker, uh, he's, he's fine with the idea of rods. He says that his, uh, his family <laughs> used rods all the time in, yeah. when, they're in, you know, farmer, when they're farmers in Indiana. So. It's a common practice. Yeah. It's just that they've, they've done scientific uh, studies. I'm it. surprised to hear it's a common practice at BYU. <laughs> well, in agriculture, I was in agricultural economics. Right, right. So we we're you all farmers. You and Ezra Tap Benson. Yeah, Ezra Tap Benson Institute was part of it. But farmers use it all the time. I mean, how else do you find water? You know, we had a cabin up here in Big Cottonwood, and I wanted to develop a, a well. And how do you find water? Well, I use a rod. And I found water and dug a well and had water. Wow. So, I mean, that's a com- it really is a common thing. It, unless you're living in the farm or in the wilderness somewhere where you need to find water, you may not know about it, but it's a common thing. Hmm. And it isn't just water you can find, which I'll tell you about sometime. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> so we digress quite a bit. But the, the point I wanted to make was that when you read DNC 8, he says it's another gift, the, the whole thing with the rod. It's another gift. It's not the one having to do with the translation. And I, I know people conflate it, and I don't see how, because I don't know how it could be more explicit, that this was a gift he had that had told him things in the past. Do they need to rewrite the preface? The preface is fine. Because it, it was talking about a gift of translation. But that the first was part. perspective. So, so, so let me make sure. This is, this is how, this is what I hear you saying. So correct okay. me if I'm yeah. making any okay. mistakes here. So Oliver wanted to translate the Book of Mormon with right. the rod. No, already you're not. He just wanted to translate the Book of Mormon. Okay. He, he wanted the gift of translation. That's one way to put it. And how was he going to use it? How was he going to, with the Urim and Thummim? With the Urim and Thummim. And the Lord said, there, this is a gift of inspiration and so on. And he says, it, it was sort of like telling Oliver, look, You've had this, you have another spiritual gift that I've helped you with in the past. So this is an additional gift I'm giving you, okay? And because Oliver may have said, well, how, how can I get a spiritual gift? And the Lord says, you already have another spiritual gift that's told you things in the past. This is an additional one. It's a, it works in a different way, so to speak. So I, I, I'm actually surprised when people think that the rod had anything to do with the translation. 
because it says right there, you have another gift you've used in the past. <laughs> and to me, uh, most I, I wouldn't be so if David would have done any translating before that. Study that in your mind. Um, well, that's in the next section when yeah. he's talking about the gift but of translation. The seem like they're They're brothers. connected. <laughs> but the gift of the, the rod or the gift of Aaron was a separate gift that Oliver had before he ever met Joseph Smith, and that he had used in the past to learn things. So it, he never used it to translate. It just said that he had told them things in the past. So it seems, I, I seriously, I had never thought that people would conflate those two gifts. So I guess I haven't read enough to see the rationale, <laughs> but the wording oh. is pretty pretty clear, I think. And sure. to, to get back, also another thing that you, no one ever thought to conflate before was the seer stone and the Yerman Thummim. Yeah, good point. So this is... Um, I don't say no one because I think a lot of people conflate those. because Well, no, no, now. I'm saying now they, now they do. But that was never done in the past. The So to go back to... Uh, so Emma wrote this letter, but she said Yerman Thummim was... She was she, the lost pages were done with the Yerman Thummim. She was referring to the interpreters because she then says, oh, but then they use the seer stone. She refers to the seer stone as a separate thing. David Whitmer. <clears throat> David Whitmer. We have an account from uh, Edward Stevenson when he visited Edward, uh, David Whitmer where uh, Stevenson says that uh, David Whitmer, this is in 1887, insisted that the... Um, the interpreters be referred to as the Yerman and Thummim, and then he referred to the seer stone as a separate thing. So even the two primary witnesses that are used to back up the stone in the hat account made a clear distinction that the term Yerman Thummim only applied to the Nephite interpreters. And then when they referred to the seer stone, they referred to that as something separate. They did not use Yerman Thummim to describe that. So, and no one before then had ever thought to make the, say that the Yerman Thummim is a seer stone. Or well, the, the, even in Mormonism Unveiled, it's in two separate paragraphs. It right. said some people say it was the stone and the hat stuff. Other people say he used the Yerman Thummim. So they, even in 1834, it wasn't conflated. Right. And of course, Joseph and Oliver always said, to make it crystal clear, they yeah. said the Yerman Thummim that came with the plates. You know, or no one's saying a seer stone came with the plates. Right. It was just the Yerman Thummim. So the reason that modern scholars, and this is a very recent development, have started to say that the Yerman Thummim could also meant the seer stone, that's to get around the fact that they know perfectly well that Joseph and Oliver repeatedly stated that the Book of Mormon was translated with the Yerman and Thummim uh, they came with the plates. They came with the plates. So they, you know, the the scholars who advocate the stone in the hat theory, they, you know, they they know their sources. They, you know, they they haven't, you know, missed those a dozen references in the Joseph Smith papers. They know perfectly well that they're there. So this is their way to get around those, is to say, oh, when they said Yerman Thummim, they also meant the seer stone. That's a completely made up bogus. Uh, argument with no foundation whatsoever, because like I said, even the stone and the hat witnesses like Emma Smith and David Whitmer m were very clear that the term Yerman Thummim only applied to the interpreters that came with the plates, but is simply a dodge that these scholars have used to get around the fact that they know perfectly well that there's a dozen accounts from so Joseph and Oliver. So why are the Oliver. scholars dodging then? Uh, what, what's, what's the advantage? Because I know in your book you were like, why are they quoting all these anti-Mormon sources? But yeah. you include, I wouldn't call David Whitmer anti-Mormon, but it sounded like you guys were. Um, well, you know, and he said Joseph was a fallen prophet. Why are we quoting all this yeah. stuff? Well, here's, what, what's, this, the, what's the advantage for church okay, historians? I, I want to answer that, but let me get, come back to where we started with this Gospel Topics essay, and, and they just did not put anything that Joseph and Oliver said about this because anyone who reads that can see that they were crystal clear about it. So rather than address it head on, they use a euphemism. They say, Joseph said he translated by the gift and power of God, period, which is, not, which is 
false, basically, because that's not all he said. He did oh. say that, but that's then it's he, like taking a, they take half of a sentence and say that's what he said. And whereas if they complete the sentence, it refutes their whole theory about the stone and the hat. And so completing the sentence is? By means of the Urim and Thummim. Yeah, that came He's, with the plates. He, it wasn't just the Urim and Thummim, he said. He said that came with the plates. And so why do they do it? I think they do it because there was this, uh, the, the critics, the John DeLynn types, keep talking about how the, the true history is that Joseph Smith used a stone in the hat. And the Joseph well, that's Jim. That's Richard Bushman. Well, Richard Bushman, to some degree. I mean, we'll talk about him in a minute if you want. But th again, it gets back to this idea: is that his, Richard Bushman was not a witness. All he's doing is evaluating. <laughs> no, seriously, the it was John Delin. I don't know. <laughs> I know, but Delin is using it as an argument. To, he's making the claim based on what Richard said in his book that the true history is Joseph Smith used a stone in the hat, and even Royal Scouts. That's what Emma said. <laughs> well, that's why we talk about Emma at length. But the point is, Emma was contradicting her own husband. And, and she was doing that 40 years after the fact. So are you going to believe Joseph or Emma? I mean, it's, it's a binary decision. You can't, you can't say they're both telling the truth. No, See, so let this, us... This, we this need is, to, I, was, I was waiting for you to go there because... I know. Here's, here's, here's why... To me, this is a false dichotomy, a total false okay. dichotomy, because... And I don't, I don't want to jump into Heartland versus Mezzo, but right. for just a moment, because okay. and, and you've got your new website about no more contention, no more contention yeah. right. because you're like, let's allow multiple theories. But right. it, it seems like when we're when we when you and Jim call David and Emma a liar because they we don't, didn't, no, no, we're no, not no, calling no, no, them no, liars. You're putting words in our mouth. Please okay. be very clear. When you say they are not reliable witnesses, okay, I'll be, I'll be more okay. more circumspect there. I'm just like, I, I, it's hard for me with all the things that David Whitmer did and Emma and, and even Oliver, Oliver, like, you know, cause he had, uh, he had his, his showdown with Joseph in sure. 1837 in Missouri and got right. excommunicated. It's hard for me to call them with all they went through unreliable. And so I'm hearing you say, well, I believe Emma when she said they used the Ur Urim and Thummim for the last 116 pages, and I believe Oliver and Emma was just wrong. No, no, no. To me, okay. you have to. No. This is this is the challenge that we face because it, when I look at it from a legal perspective, I'm not saying anybody was a liar. That's the key point. People jump to that. My critics say, "Well, now you're calling them liars." And I said, "No, they're liars." What are they actually saying? They misremembered. They no, not Roger even. Clements. Not even. That's why I talk about this demonstration thing. Because David Whitmer described, they were sitting around the table, et cetera. I said, okay, fine. There's no reason for him to lie about that, right? But when people, when he reaches a conclusion that this is how the translation was done, when he never even looked in the hat to see what was words on there, he, he actually said, a couple of them actually said what appeared on the stone. None of them looked on the stone. So they weren't witnesses of that. It had to be hearsay or assumptions or inferences. Had to be. That's the only explanation there is. And so in Emma's case, if she was present at this demonstration, which she was in the Whitmer home at the time, she would have recounted that. But you have to remember also that she was having to deal with the Solomon Spaulding theory, which was a prevailing narrative. And, and if Joseph was using the Urim and Thummim in the plates, he had to be behind a screen, right? Or a veil. And so for them, this was the, the, the dilemma that Joseph was in. Because he, and that's, you know, here's another question. Why do you think he kept emphasizing that the angel told him he couldn't show the plates or the Urim to anybody? That, that was kind of almost a throwaway line, but there's a real reason why he had to explain that. Because he couldn't tell everybody that, or he couldn't show those items to people as to explain how he was doing the translation. And yet he had to have it screened off so that other than him and Oliver or maybe John Whitmer, who actually said Joseph used the Yerman Thummim in the plates, was another scribe. Right. And Christian Whitmer never said anything, so we don't know what he said. But you have Oliver and, and John Whitmer who both said Joseph used the plates in the Yerman Thummim, and they were the scribes. Emma was an outlier, but she never talked about it in any detail. And by 1870, the narrative to refute the Spalding theory was the stone in the hat idea that there was nothing nothing between me and Joseph. He wasn't reading from any book, right? All that stuff. 
So when she wrote that letter to Emma Pilgrim, which, by the way, was never meant for publication, <laughs> and was we don't know I don't what think the question they was. Wrote was meant for publication except the Book of Mormon, the Doctrine and Covenants. <laughs> well, Joseph and Oliver's um, accounts were published. Well, in the newspapers. Yeah. Okay. And they so were they intentional. Were it was right in the Wentworth letter. You know, okay. how much more official can that be? Yeah. And in and the, and the elders. Uh, There's the a lot elders of private story. correspondence that I don't think they ever intended to get published, though. <laughs> That's true. And Emma's was one. Yeah. But if Emma had been doing a formal statement for church history, she may have worded that a lot differently. Okay. And so for people to latch on to that little phrase in that letter, in the, in the, as you mentioned, the rest of the letter, she admitted she couldn't remember a lot of stuff. So even when she was baptized, you know, so people latch on to that as this is the more uh, credible, more, more relatable, more true than what Joseph Smith and Oliver Cowdery said at the time, formally published. And so w the reason I think the scholars... Well, let me ask you this. If Oliver had never returned to the church, would yeah. you consider him a quote-unquote hostile witness? No, not at all, because he, w he was, other than Joseph Smith... He was the only witness to the restoration of the priesthood, the restoration of all the temple blessings. He was the one who um, called the 12 apostles, really, and set them apart. And all. I mean, he was integral to the whole thing. He was the second elder of the church. Yeah, he was the assistant was president of the church. Yeah, He was higher well, in authority. Well, David Whitmer was a three witness. Emma was his wife. I mean, no, 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 no. Who can make a lot of connections no, 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 no. is what I'm saying. David, Oliver Cowdery was a different category than David Whitmer. He was the assistant president of the church, which was higher in authority than the first and second counselor. Mm -hmm. He was designated as a spokesman. He wrote all the those essays about church history that we talk about, letter seven, and all the rest. But he was doing that in his official capacity as assistant president of the church. And so and and he testified about the appearance of John the Baptist and so on. So he was he was what made the the restoration credible at all. If it had only, and Richard's talked about this, how Joseph was unique because he had... Richard Bushman? Yeah, he, he said jo Joseph was unique because he had a second witness. It wasn't just one guy saying, I had a vision and everybody should do this. He had someone else that also testified. And the fact that they had a falling out, but they, they continued to at, or explain what had actually happened to them is a further testimony of the, their veracity. Because typically, if people are lying about something and they have a falling out, they start accusing each other of lying, right, about what happened. But that it didn't happen with Joseph and Oliver. And so Oliver Cowdery, to me, is in some ways even more credible than Joseph Smith, because Joseph Smith already had a, an experience with Martin Harris. He had the reputation in the, within his family and so on. Oliver Cowdery came from the outside, and he was part of this whole thing. And he had no agenda. He wasn't trying to form a church or he didn't have a reputation or any of that. He was just a guy who wanted to do what the Lord wanted and had these experiences. And he was really the first to talk about him publicly. And so when he came back to the church, of course, he reaffirmed his testimony of all these things. But even when he wrote his first letter about um, days never to be forgotten, you know, that's in the Pearl of Great Price, that right there is a very firm, strong testimony of this whole thing, that he used the, what the Nephites would have called interpreters. And so I, I just, I, I understand, you, the question you asked earlier was, why are the historians conflating all this? Mm -hmm. And I think they're trying to assuage the critics like John DeLynn, who says, oh, it was stone in the hat. He didn't use the Urmathumma. <laughs> well, but even Royal Skousen uh -huh. made a statement. I, he's retracted, I think, but I don't know if it's going to be in his final book, that Joseph and Oliver deliberately misled everybody when they talked about the Urmathumma. Oh, wow. Because they said, according to I Royal Skousen... I would like Skousen, to see that statement. <laughs> well, yeah, I, I can but, show it to you. But and he's, and he's not like coming out of crazy land. He's following David Whitmer. Royal well, Scouts is following okay. David Whitman so, when he says it, that. I mean, does it boil down to you guys privilege Joseph and Oliver over everybody and others Others are accepting Emma and David Whitmer? And you just yeah. don't think they're when, when you as, say, as credible? When you say over everybody, I would say you have John Whitmer, Oliver Cowdery, and Joseph Smith versus Emma Smith and David Whitmer and arguably Oliver's wife on one statement that she supposedly made an affidavit that we don't even know is legitimate. But it was basically those two. 
And yeah. Martin Harris is another. And so case. the LDS historians are trying to bring everything together, and you guys are like Joseph and Oliver are the bomb, and no, we're trying. We bring them together. We. This is where I, where I want to clarify for your audience because okay. my critics have accused me incorrectly of this. I'm not saying anybody was a liar at all. Just like in court, you have all these witnesses, they're mm -hmm. all contradicting each other. None of them are lying. They're talking about their own experience, their own perception, things they heard, they mingle it with their memory, and all that happens all the time. And so I'm not saying David Whitmer is a liar. Now, when it comes to what he says about the priesthood and Joseph as a fallen prophet and all that stuff, maybe he was, let's say, um, <laughs> elaborating or e uh, accentuating problems that he had, embellishing. Yeah, but tailoring his memories yeah. to suit his later prejudices. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and so, and I also want to emphasize that I'm not saying there's only one possible interpretation of all this because of multiple working hypotheses. Well, yeah. If, if people want to believe it, and I have no problem with it. I don't have a problem with Garrett Dirtmatt's book, except that he omits evidence that contradicts his theory. And that I think is inexcusable. I, we don't do that. I put all the evidence in here. And I think the Gospel Topics essay is, is a, the primary culprit, let's say, of misinforming members of the church, because it, it doesn't tell what Joseph and Oliver said. I've asked missionaries about this. They've never heard these statements from Joseph and Oliver about the Urim and Thummim. They've never heard it in, in seminary. They didn't hear it in their missionary training. And so they're all told this stone in the hat. And I say, well, what do you think of that? And they say, well, it's kind of weird, you know. Uh, and, and older people, of course, who were taught what Joseph and Oliver said, are having a real hard time accepting that they were wrong. The stone in the hat. <laughs> yeah. Right. And so when Royal Skousen said, he concluded that Joseph and Oliver deliberately were misleading people, that's the inevitable logical conclusion of the stone in the hat. You can't, you can't reconcile what Joseph and Oliver said with the stone in the hat other than by saying that Joseph and Oliver misled everybody. And I mean, that well, to give you a very specific ex factual issue. So after the uh, pages were lost, the uh, plates and the interpreters were taken back from Joseph. And then David Whitmer says that that's when the, um, he started using the seer stone in the hat. And, but Joseph, Oliver, and Lucy said that no, the plates and the interpreters were returned to Joseph, and that's what he used to make the translation. Now, that's just an, a, con a factual contradiction. Both those things can't be true, that the angel uh, did give back the plates and the interpreters and that he did not give back the plates and interpreters. It's just you can't, both statements can't be true. David Whitmer, who was not a witness, who was not present, who was 100 miles away when these events happened, who had, um, you know, was not involved in any way with the translation. He's the source that says that the plates and interpreters were not given back. Joseph and Oliver, who were present at the time, who were involved in the entire process and left contemporaneous accounts, written accounts, they said that the plates and the interpreters were given back. And that's what they used for the translation of the Book of Mormon that we have. Now, the, the two... You simply cannot reconcile that's a factual contradiction and it's either one is true or the other is, is not true. So let, take let, a let step back and say this. Yeah. So say that it's not involving religion. This is not anything. It's a question of some, some other historical thing. You know, what did some regiment do during the Re Revolutionary War? Or just some, you know, some, his, you know, why was a county formed? You know, you know, just any historical fact. You have two witnesses who were present at the time, who left, who were involved in the situation, who left relatively, uh, you know, written, published statements that they themselves were published during their lifetimes uh, of, you know, stating their view of the particular historical event on the one hand. And then you have another person who was, came in after the fact, wasn't present for the event, uh, you know, was on the scene like short sometime after the event happened. And 40 years later, he says, oh, no, you know, Abe and, uh, you know, Elihu were wrong in their accounts because this is what really happened. 
just, you know, who's more credible? Who's more credible from just a simple, you know, I got to kind of, I have two absolutely contradictory statements, which is the one that is more credible? Uh, as far as, you know, I'm writing my history. I'm going to say what happened, you know, why this political event happened or what did this regiment do during the war or whatever. Whatever the historical issue is, I've got two contemporaneous eyewitness accounts that were published close in time by the actual witnesses themselves. And I got something from a guy who showed up after the fact um, and 40 years later, he contradicted what the two guys, the other two guys said. I mean, it's, that's the argument. Now, that's... L l let me say something about that, though. Yeah. So there's multiple working hypotheses. People, people can choose to reject what Joseph and Oliver said. That's, I have no problem. If they want to reject that, fine, because everybody can interpret the evidence. But they're wrong. No, well, no, no. no, I'm not no, even no. saying they're wrong. What I'm saying is that not including what Joseph and Oliver said in the discussion is wrong. Mm -hmm. Because no. the Gospel Topics essay just pretends Joseph and Oliver never said anything about this. In fact, it, it as much as states that when it misinterprets and misrepresents what Joseph said when he was asked about the, the coming forth of the Book of Mormon. It, it trans. But it only that. uses half the sentence. Yeah, it uses part of the sentence. But it, it, it says Joseph never said anything about the translation except that it was by the gift and power of God. That's just a false statement, and it's right in the Gospel Topics essays. So it's misleading members of the church. It's also misleading non-members of the church. And so the, um, the challenge for us is to try to clarify our position. We're not saying it's our way or the highway. We're not saying you have to agree with us at all. We're saying, here's all the evidence. And anyone who omits some of the evidence because it contradicts their theory is misleading people. And so I think John DeLynn, you know, he kind of started all this with his um, faith crisis report and he, he called it a gap between truth and church history. And he said this stone in the hat thing was in that gap and the, churches, the church leaders are misleading everybody and all that, right? And, and the current critics have, have embellished that even more because they're saying that the real history was a stone in the hat and everybody from Joseph and Oliver on that was faithful LDS was misleading everybody. And so that's where I think the... the the real emphasis that we're trying to make is we think we go with Joseph and Oliver, but those who don't go with Joseph and Oliver don't even know what Joseph and Oliver said. And so if, if we could do anything to make a difference in the world, <laughs> it would be to have the gospel topics essays actually tell members of the church everywhere in every language, what Joseph Smith and Oliver Cowdery actually said about the translation. And then, and Gar it'd be awesome if Garrett Dirtmack would address this. But I, I put doesn't. out a feeler to see if I can get him on. Okay. Okay. I heard I, we ought to have so. a discussion together because I'd love to get his views on this. Yeah, yeah. Right. I hope you enjoyed our conversation with Jonathan Neville and Jim Lucas. In our next conversation, we're going to talk about why does it matter how Joseph translated. For me, it's an issue of the credibility of Joseph Smith and Oliver Cowdery. Right. Because the whole restoration depends on those two only. If you'd like to hear the entire interview uncut, subscribe on either Patreon or at GospelTangents.com. For just $5 a month, you can hear the entire audio uninterrupted. On our $10 tier, if you'd like to see the whole video, you can see that uh, either on youtube.com slash gospel tangents, or I've got a special Facebook group devoted for uh, full videos. So subscribe at gospeltangents.com and uh, sign up for just $10 a month. For $20 a month, if you'd like to get some bonus content, uh, maybe some of the stuff that ended up on the cutting room floor, you can sign up for that. And then if you'd like to talk to me for $100 a month, we'll, we'll do a monthly phone call on something like Zoom, and you can ask me anything you want. So thanks again. Also, don't forget about the merch, mugs, T-shirts, um, hats, things like that. I'm trying to get the ties up there. Hopefully I can get up, up there. And uh, thanks again for watching Gospel Tangents. And click here for some more videos.